following is a video presentation of a worship service at Orville Baptist Church. chapter 3 verses 15 through 17 and the apostle Paul writes let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and through psalms hymns and songs from the spirit singing to God with gratitude in your hearts and whatever you do whether in word or deed do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. We have much to thank the Lord for. Amen. Amen. So let's stand today as we sing, For the beauty of the earth, Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. <clears throat> Especially we welcome all of our mothers and words are not adequate enough to uh, describe to you how much we are grateful and thankful for all that you do and continue to do in serving uh, the Lord, serving your families, serving community and so many other things that you do. We could not do it without you. So let's again, let's give a wonderful applause to our mothers. Thank you much. This is your day, and we celebrate alongside you, and I know that all of you mothers have uncertain plans that the family has been making for you on this your special day, and we wish you all the very, very best. And mothers who are joining us online, let me as pastor of Orville Baptist Church welcome you to our services and say to you as well, we appreciate all of our mothers and those who join online not only today but all of you who join us online 
Uh, every Sunday, we are grateful for the opportunity to extend our services to you through the digital means and uh, the opportunity to electronically produce these services so you can join in with us. Obviously, at any time, we'd love to have you join us in person. Again, we want to welcome you. If you are a guest, would you do us a favor, please? You will find a guest card in one of the pew racks in front of you. If you'll take that card and fill that information out and place it in the offering plate when we receive our offerings later today, we'd appreciate that very, very much. And for those that perhaps have been uh, members of this church of the years, we're and really been tied up. A lot of folks have a lot of stuff going on on Sundays, but you were able to make your way here today. We're grateful that you are here. Let's all join together in prayer. Heads are bowed, eyes closed. And Father, as we join together in prayer, we first and foremost always want to honor our Heavenly Father. And yet here we are on Sunday morning with the opportunity, Father, to bless and celebrate and honor our mothers. And we're grateful for their great love and how unconditionally they <coughs> sacrifice and serve. And we are grateful as a nation to be able to set aside for all these years this day to honor them. We pray it will be a special blessing to mothers everywhere. And Lord Jesus, as we continue to go through this service today, we give you honor and glory and praise to worship you because you're the one who created and made us for a purpose in this life and also for eternity. And so let everything that is done today not only celebrate our mothers, but more importantly, honor the Lord Jesus Christ. Give us ears to hear what your spirit says to the church today. And bless all those who are watching online and speak to their hearts as well. We surrender this service to you and celebrate and honor your name on Mother's Day. We pray all of this in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And all God's people said...
Let's pray. Lord, it's just been an honor to be here today in this place of worship, Lord, on this special day, Lord, as we honor all the mothers. And we just ask you to continue to bless them, Lord, and just help them have a great day. And we just want to praise you for all your wonderful blessings, Lord. And as we take these tithes and offerings, we just want to use them for your kingdom. Amen. sparrow and he watches over me thank you Mildred well I debated on whether or not to pause my series from the book of Jude and speak a message specifically tailored for mothers but I decided against it mothers don't get upset at me I spent some time in prayer about continuing my series and the Lord put it on my heart not to break the series up but go right ahead and continue where we left off so strap in mothers and all and get ready for the ride because we are looking at a series of messages that really is unpopular it's a book that is nestled right after the book of the revelation right between uh, first, second, third, John, and Revelation. And it is placed there strategically because it deals with the last things in the end days. And the topic that Jude uh, conveys and shares with us is what we call apostasy. And that word simply means falling away from the faith. And so, hence the title, Jude, the Apostate Files. And we're on message number four today. And here's the title of the message. And it comes out of Jude, verses 14 through 16, that we're going to try to unpack. Here comes the judge. Now, remember, I think it was in the 70s, early 80s, there used to be a bumper sticker that says, Here come the judge. Well, let's see what uh, Jude says about the judge who is the supreme judge of all the universe. And here, note with me in verses 14 and following, just three short verses we'll unpack today. Here's what Jude says about the apostates, the falling away. And he references an Old Testament prophet, an Old Testament preacher. Maybe you didn't know Enoch was a preacher. Listen to what he writes. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them. Now think about that word. We're going to look at that in just a moment. Most people don't understand that Enoch, the one was translated in Genesis 5, he walked so close with God, God said, just walk right on into heaven. But it says he was a preacher, a prophet. He says, see, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones. And let's see what he says about that. 
He says, I think I can get this to advance. If not, advance that. My phone. All right, there you go. He's coming to do what? Judge everyone. There's not a person on planet Earth in the past, present, or future that will not go through a judgment time. Even Christians. I wish I had time to develop that, but there is going to be what is called in the New Testament the judgment bar, the judgment seat of Christ. Now, that's not to determine whether you go to heaven or not. It's to determine what you did for Christ while you were here. And so he says, to judge everyone and to convict all of them of all the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness and of all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Notice how many times he uses the word ungodly. That doesn't matter what walk of life you're in. If you, you are either godly and strive to be godly or you are ungodly. And the only ones I know that will get to heaven are the godly ones. And the only way that's possible is by coming to the cross and receiving Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and forgiveness of your sins. Because the scripture says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all came to the world ungodly, but all of us don't have to leave that way. But here Jude says, listen, he's coming to judge all these ungodly. And then notice what else he said. These people... The ungodly ones are grumblers, fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. And so let's unpack these three verses quickly today on Mother's Day and see what he's talking about as we look at that title again. Here comes the judge. And he, in doing so, he mentions... The very first thing, he says, there is Enoch who prophesied, that Old Testament prophet. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but I wonder how many of you know who Enoch was. If you go back to Genesis 5, we won't do that today for time's sake. But let me just kind of give you the Reader's Digest concisely as I can to give you a snapshot of who Enoch was. He was that... He was that man who started walking with God after his baby was born, and he named him Methuselah. And the Bible says Enoch, this father, this man, was 65 years of age. Prior to starting to walk with God, he spent 65 years knowing about God, but was ungodly. Did not have a relationship with God. And there was something about the birth of that little baby boy that changed his life. He became a father. Now, I know this is Mother's Day, but I want to tell you just a little bit about this father. This little baby coming into his life changed his perspective and responsibility on how to raise that kid. And that's where God began to come into the picture. And Enoch realized that he did not know God, and he started walking with God, and he named his boy Methuselah, which is a compounding of two Hebrew words that we learned Wednesday night. That means when he goes, it is going to come. In other words, he knew that however long Methuselah, his boy, lived, when he died, judgment was coming. God revealed to this preacher, this, prof, this prophet, that there was coming a judgment. And so we know that Enoch had that in his mind as he walked with God, this preacher, this prophet, this man of God. And the Bible says he walked so close to God, it says that in Hebrews, he walked by faith, lived by faith, and he pleased God. That was his testimony. And one day at age 365, he's just trucking along, talking to God, really just enjoying that relationship. And God says, you're closer to my home than you are yours. Why don't you just come on into heaven? And he was translated. He was the first of two men in all of history that did not experience death. Can you imagine that? 
hard to wrap our brains around that. But I want to mention this morning, not only the fact that Enoch knew the judgment, which was right before the flood, by the way, because he lived in days, watch this, of apostasy, just like our day. No different. There was a great falling away and an abandoning of God during the days of Noah, in the days that Enoch lived. The culture had said no to God. And Enoch, in spite of how the culture was, he walked with God and went against the grain. Now listen. What we're going to find out in the next few moments, and I want you to really get your thinking cap on, is that God spoke to this prophet, this preacher, not only about impending judgment during the days before the flood, and he did so by saying, when your boy dies, judgment is coming. Did it come, ladies and gentlemen? It was called the Great Flood. And by the way, parenthetically, do you know that Methuselah lived to be 969 years of age, the oldest man that ever lived, and the exact year that Methuselah died was the year the flood came. So when Methuselah died, when he is gone, it will come. Now watch this. Enoch knew not only about impending judgment in his day, God allowed him to look through the quarters of time in the future and cast his eyes upon another mountain peak of prophecy. And in the distant future, far distant future, Enoch prophesied and preached that Jesus was coming again, and a future judgment was coming when Jesus was going to judge the world. And ladies and gentlemen, look right here at me. We are moving rapidly and ever so to that second time when God is going to judge this world. Now let's pack, unpack this real quick, because here's what I want you to see. Just two things. First of all, notice with me in your outline what I call the substance or the content of the prophecy. Think about what he says. He, he lets us know, hey, I'm going to show you some things about the substance of the prophecy. And in doing so, he's mentioning to us that... Uh, He's looking at this mountain peak, and it's like looking at a, two mountains from a distance. And you see these two mountain peaks, because some people get confused as to what he's talking about when he says he's coming with thousands of his saints, his holy ones. They ask the question, is that referring, Pastor, to the first coming of Christ or the second coming of Christ? Well, it's like this. You look at these two mountain peaks from a distance, and... From a distance, it looks like they appear as one. But the closer you get to it, you notice there's a valley in between these two mountain peaks. Well, the first mountain peak of prophecy is that the prophets of old prophesied that Jesus was coming the first time. That he was coming to the cross. But that's not what uh, Enoch is talking about. He's not talking about the cross. He's looking at that second mountain peak and he says, I want to tell you what's going on. I want you to see this second mountain peak. The set, second mountain peak is the second coming of Christ. And again, I want to just refer to you what he says here. And here's what he says. Uh, see, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones. Now, during the first coming of Christ to the cross, did Jesus come to the earth with thousands and thousands of his holy ones to accompany him? No. The Bible says he came unto his own world and his own people knew him not. And when Jesus went to the cross, 
He didn't come with thousands and thousands of his holy ones. He died on the cross alone and abandoned. So Enoch's not talking about that. He's talking about the time in the future when you and I as saints are going to come with Jesus on horses. We're going to come back. We're going to be that army. I believe that passage is referring to, and you read more about it in Revelation 19. I wish I had time to unpack it. But Revelation 19 gives us a description of what it's going to look like when he comes again. And I believe that's going to be with the saints and with the angels all coming with him to execute. He's going to execute judgment. Now, we know in Bible prophecy that there is two phases to the coming again of Christ. Phase one is there will be a time when all believers are going to be taken out of the world before the wrath of God and the judgment of God falls upon the earth. And I say hallelujah, amen to that. Aren't you glad if you and I are around in death? I always like to say it like this. I, I hope the upper taker gets me before the undertaker does. But if the undertaker gets me first, I, I'm going to be ready to go on to see the upper taker anyway. Amen? But let's just say, if we linger, because we know there are going to be believers and the church is still in the world when the Lord comes, phase one. Before God unleashes his judgment and wrath, just like it happened in Noah's day, God always has a remnant, and he says, I will not let you remain here during my wrath. That's why you see uh, Noah and his family, they were spared. Well, there's coming a day when the church is going to be taken up out of this world, and we call that the rapture. But look at this. When we're in heaven celebrating our home going, the Lord says, I'm glad you're up here, hang in there, because God's about to pour His wrath upon the earth. And in just a very short moment, we're all going to band together, and we're going to leave heaven, and we're going to come back to earth, and you're going to come with me. And that's what He's referring to. Thousands upon thousands of holy ones. Now, the Greek translation to those words, thousands, you ready for this? Is an innumerable amount myriads you cannot count them only God knows how many there are aren't you glad that God knows even the very hairs on your head are numbered even those that are no longer there he knew where they were God numbers all of those myriads and he says they're coming so not only are we going to be taken up but we're going to come back with him and here's what he said is going to happen, hence the title, Here Comes the Judge. Notice what he says. <laughs> I'm coming to execute judgment. I'm coming to bring judgment on this world. And so I want to just spend just a moment talking about that judgment. We know that he's coming to judge. The Bible says there again in verse 15, Listen to this from John 5, 22. Jesus said this. I'm coming to judge. Jesus is the judge. This, here's what it says. The Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son. Acts 17, 31. The Apostle Paul says in verse 31, God has declared a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness, watch this, by that man, referring to Jesus, whom he has appointed. Now, folks, either you will face God in your sins or you will face God in Christ. Aren't you glad for a believer? The Bible says in Romans, therefore now, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Aren't you glad God is not going to pronounce judgment and separate you from all eternity from Him? Aren't you glad that your name is placed in the book of life, the Lamb's book of life? But He says, to all the ungodly, to all the apostates, to all unbelievers, 
I am going to allow my son to execute judgment on all of you. And you'll be lost for all eternity. And that Jude is just reminding not only are the apostates lost and ungodly, but there are people who are unbelievers that are lost. No matter what walk of life you're in, someday the Lord is going to come and judge you and he wants to be your savior now, but one day he'll have to be your judge. I remember a little boy, a story about a little boy that was out there in the highway on Main Street years ago, and a car was barreling down, and that boy did not see the car, nor did the car, the driver, see the little boy. And I'm telling you, they were going to collide. And a man stood on the sidewalk on the curb and saw what was going on before his eyes. And he rushed out there and pushed that boy away just in the nick of time before that car hit him. Saved his life. Well, it's sad to say that little boy grew up in a life of crime. And he found himself before a judge, ready to be sentenced. And the little boy who now is a young man looks at the judge and he recognizes the judge why it was the same man that years earlier had saved his life and he looks at the judge and he says don't you remember me judge you saved me when I was a little boy and the judge said to the little boy young man there was a day when I was your savior but today I'm your judge Ladies and gentlemen, don't let it be said about any of us that the Lord would say, I wanted to be your Savior. I wanted to be your friend. I wanted to have a relationship with you. I would have and could have been your Savior, but now I am your judge. Depart from me. Well, that's exactly what Enoch, or Jude is telling us here as he uses Enoch as an illustration. So either, again, face God in your sins or face God in Christ. I, I want to share something else because this has been on my heart. I, I've heard this excuse so many times from so many different people. They'll say, you know, Pastor, here's why I'm not a Christian. And, and they'll start making excuses and they'll say, because of all the hypocrites. Have you ever heard that before? Look at all those hypocrites down at the church. Or... Look at that preacher or look at that church and they'll use all of these excuses to say this is why I don't go to church. This is why I don't give my life to God. Now watch this. And those listening online, listen carefully. <laughs> you better understand it is yours and yours alone responsibility to be accountable before God. You won't have an excuse, one, to say to God, those hypocrites, those preachers, those churches, they're too legalistic. They're this, that, and the other. And that's why I didn't come to God. God's going to say, I'm not asking you what you thought about those other people. I'm asking you, what did you do with me? It is every person's responsibility to answer for their life. And I tell you, we all individually and personally will stand before an awesome God and be held accountable. No crowds are going to be with you. No beer drinking group, party group is going to be with you. You alone will stand before God solo. And he's going to say, what did you do with me? He's not going to ask you, what did the other people do? What did you do with me? You remember Jesus said to his disciples, what do people say that, who do people say that I am? And they said, oh, the crowd's saying you're this, that, and the other. And then he asked the most probing, pointed question. And he said, what do you, you think about me? So don't, don't blame it on somebody else as using an excuse for not following Christ. There'll be no excuses in that day. But then I want you to see as we close 
this message in, in just a moment, but let me just add one other caveat, and then we'll look at this next point before we wrap this up. I know that there are a lot of people, especially in today's society, that on, are uncomfortable when it comes to preaching something that makes them feel guilty. Now, I'm not talking about self-imposed guilt. I'm not talking about people-imposed guilt. That's wrong. I'm talking about conviction. When the Holy Spirit convicts you, understand this. There are those, and increasingly so today in America, that want their ears tickled. They want preaching to make them feel comfortable. They want a sermon that will make them feel good about themselves. We have folks today that want self-helps, want to bolster their self-esteem, how to improve self. And when you think about that, you and I must think about what Jesus said because I find in the Bible nowhere where Jesus says, let me tell you how to promote self. Let me tell you how to start feeling good about yourself. And I've heard many, many preachers uh, through the years that talk about how to improve and make your best life. Have you ever read anything, how to live your best life? Have you ever heard any teaching, how to be your best person, you could, the best person that you are, how to be your best self? Well, let me tell you what Jesus said. You ready? Jesus said, if anyone's going to come after me, watch this, he must deny himself. Oh, I don't want that preaching. <laughs> it's about me. I want, to, I want to feel good. Well, listen, there, there are times that the Bible makes you feel good. Uh, the, the scripture is given, it says, to encourage, to exhort, to rebuke, rebuke reproof, correct? Uh, and, and all of it, and I've said this many times before, the Bible, when it's preached, will either make you glad, sad, or mad. It depends on where your walk is that day. <laughs> and, and, and so he says, deny self. But what did Jesus say about your best life? Jesus said, if anyone wants to follow me, you must lose your life. Oh, man, that don't sound like modern-day preaching. That's not the kind of preaching I want to hear, but that's the kind of preaching Jesus did. If you want to find your life, lose it for my sake. Well, that's not a popular message. Well, no, it isn't. But I tell you what, it pleases God. If anyone wants to follow me, he says, I'm not going to try to give you self-helps and build your self-esteem. I want you to deny yourself. Whoa. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, this world can never help you get better. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's not anything in this world that will improve your condition for eternity. God has all that on the other side. It was never designed since the fall of man to live a comfortable, self-improved, not denying self-life. It could never be because we lived in a cursed world, on a cursed planet, and a fallen nature, and it will never please your, your heart or ever fully, completely satisfy you. That's why people buy this and buy that and go here and go there and it's still not enough. It never truly really satisfies. It wears off. Guess what, ladies and gentlemen? When we get to heaven, none of that's going to wear off. It's all going to be good. Amen? And it's going to be that way for how long? It's going to be that way all the time, throughout eternity. So God says, you're not home yet. Don't get, don't get tied up in this world. Yes, you live in the world. Enjoy things in the world. Don't focus on this stuff. It will never satisfy. You're living for the wrong world. Keep your eyes on the world in which you are a citizen of. Your citizenship, the Bible says, in heaven, not on earth. I live on earth, but I'm a citizen from up there. My family's up there as well as down here. And as I get older, I'm seeing the population shift. They're all leaving. And they're going home. <laughs> and someday the world is going to have the judgment of God fall upon it 
And so Jude is very clear to remind us of that, about apostasy and the falling away and the judgment that's going to come. And then the last thing I want you to see, he talks about the subjects of this prophecy, and I'm just going to read these verses because we see, note with me, first of all, what I call the apostate's disposition. What is it, the disposition? Well, here's what it says. These people are never happy. <laughs> You ever met anybody like that? He says they're grumblers and fault finders. They're never happy. And, and the Lord says these apostates, these people who don't, you know, uh, follow God and embrace His truth, they're never happy. They're always fault finding and they're always complaining and grumbling. I could really spend a whole lot of time there, but I'm not going to give any more time to the grumblers or to the fault finders. You're focusing on the wrong thing. But then, I want you to notice, note with me what I call the apostates' debauchery. And this is really an indicator of our last days in which we're living. I, I really believe we're on the cusp of the last days of the end time. Tell me we're not. Look at this description. He says, here's their characteristics. Here's what drives them and motivates them. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. So let's look at that first phrase. They follow their own passions. And that included in that translation, it's a real broad description. One of the areas in the last days, there'll be an increase of passion toward perversion and the sexual perversion that will run rampant in our society. Look right up here at me. Are we not seeing that today? Are we not seeing sexually the perversion that is going on in America and around the world? Jesus said, just like it was in the days of Noah, they were doing it too. So shall it be in the last days of man. Like it was in the days of Lot. Was there not immorality occurring in Sodom and Gomorrah? And so Enoch said, uh, Jude says, listen, Enoch is saying, hey, judgment's coming. And Jude says, this is what's going to take place. Here's the characteristics. Look at all the debauchery, their own evil desires. But it has to do with that broader term. Their des Watch this. It basically says their passions and desires are always self-centered. Their desire is to live their life to please numo, numero uno, to please number one. It's about living and spending life only for one's desires. Whatever pleases them, that is priority. And the Lord said, not so with a believer. And so he says, hey, this is one of their characteristics. I mean, their infections are set on this world, not the next world. He's saying that this apostate behavior is characterized by living in such a way that all you want to do is fulfill your own selfish desires. And he says, not only that, they boast about themselves and they flatter others for their own advantages. They flatter people to get what they want. And they'll tell people anything that a person would want to hear about themselves. Don't we all sometimes succumb to the uh, eloquence of the flattering tongue that says, oh, look at you. Aren't you wonderful? You're the greatest in size. And they'll tell you anything, but it's about their own advantage. They'll tell you what you want to hear because they want something from you. Be careful of the flatterer. I want to close today by saying these words. I heard it from a man of God years ago. He said it like this, Today, the great question is not what you will do with Jesus. In that day, the question will become, what will he do with you? 
And we know what Jude says he's going to do to the apostates and to all who leave planet earth without ever coming to Jesus and receiving him as their Savior. What is Jesus going to say about me and what is he going to say about you? I hope he will say, welcome home. Son, daughter, welcome into the joy of your Lord, the things God has prepared for you. You were a good and faithful servant. Now, he didn't say perfect servant, did he? Who among us is perfect? Any perfect people in here? I, I hope you didn't raise your hand. You will be perfect one day. But here's what he says. Welcome home, you good and what? Faithful servant. And like Enoch of old, in his days of fall, the falling away and the apostasy that was characteristic of the days of Noah, where did you find Enoch? You found him walking with God. He had this testimony. He pleased God. So you can walk with God. That's what you're doing here at church this morning. That's why we come to church. We could be out there on the golf course or we can go out there shopping or mowing our lawn or doing everything else like the world does we could, we could like some people say i got better things to do with my sunday i can't think of anything better for us to do than to be in the house of god together on the lord's day doing what pleases him and builds us up in our holy faith to get us ready so that we take that step like Enoch and someday we're going to walk right in. <laughs> we're going to walk right in. And the Lord's going to say, let me give you a hug. You're a good and faithful servant. You never gave up during the time of increasing, uh, falling away. When the culture was going the opposite way, you stayed true. And you fought the fight. You finished the course. And you've kept the faith. And you're home at last. It'll all be worth it that day, won't it? So let's keep on keeping on. Let's pray that others will come along. And if you who are listening today don't know Christ, oh, for Christ's sake, don't be one of those ungodly that the judgment, the sickle of judgment will swing fast and sure and cut you out. I don't want to miss heaven for the world. Do you? Don't miss heaven for this world. Let's stand together.